Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we're, welcome everyone. We're very excited to have you today for a show shared in the kitchen, lightening up holiday desserts with Paula Scheuer. I'm Jessica Jablon, the California Program Coordinator at Share, Share It. For those of you who don't know about Share, Share It, we help women and families facing breast and ovarian cancer, as well as those who are at elevated genetic risk through free, confidential, and personalized support and resources. We also provide health education throughout the country. One of our goals during COVID is to make sure that we are offering healthy living and cancer prevention information to you during this hard time and giving you what support you need. In addition to our virtual services that can be found on our website or by emailing us, you can also access prior webinars on a range of cancer related topics, as well as access our calendar of upcoming virtual programs through our website. Before we begin, just a few housekeeping items. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be posted on Charcheret's website along with a transcript. Participants' faces and names will not be in the recording as long as you remain muted. If you would like to remain private, you can turn off your video and rename yourself, or you can call into the webinar. And instructions are in the chat box now for both options. You may have noticed all participants were muted upon entry. Please keep yourself on mute throughout the call. If you have questions for Paula, Put them in the chat box, either publicly, or you can click on share, share it in the chat box to submit a private question, and I will ask them throughout the program. We are very excited to be continuing our new season of share, share it in the Kitchen, an initiative in partnership with Cedar sinai here in Los Angeles to empower those of us at risk for breast and ovarian cancer to make healthier diet choices. Prior share, share it in the Kitchen webinars can be accessed on our website at the link in the chat. You should have received the recipes for today's program in advance. My colleague is putting the link in, that, in the chat box so you can download and print it or see it on your screen. We want to thank our generous sponsors, Cedar sinai the Cooperative Agreement DP19-1906 from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, AZI, GSK, Merck, CGEN, and the Sigmund and Edith Blumenthal Memorial Fund. Their incredible support has allowed us to continue to provide our series of webinars throughout the pandemic. In addition to the many support services and resources we offer at Charcheret, our outreach team goes into communities across the country, sometimes virtually, sometimes in person, to educate women and men about the increased risk of hereditary breast and ovarian cancer among Jewish families, the measures they can take to protect their health, the importance of knowing their family health history and Charcheret's resources. We partner with synagogues, organizations, healthcare professionals, campus organizations, just to name a few, to plan events like Teal and Pink Shabbats or Teal and Pink Challah Bakes, panel discussions with experts like doctors, genetic counselors, or nutritionists, wellness programs with yoga or Pilates instructors, and trainings specifically for healthcare professionals, and more. We customize events and bring life-saving education to your individual community. If you're interested in finding more about planning an engaging educational program in your area, please email info at charshareit.org or fill out the survey at the end of the webinar. Now, before we get cooking, I wanna introduce you to Annie, a wonderful member of our advisory committee here in California, who is going to share her personal story with us. Good morning. Uh, I'm Annie Spar, uh, as Jessica said, a member of the West Coast Advisory Committee of Char Sherrod, and I'm really excited to be here today and excited for Paula's class. I've known about Char Sherrod for a very long time. So full disclosure, my sister-in-law was the clinical director of Char Sherrod for over a decade, and I always knew it was a wonderful organization, but I didn't truly understand what they did. But then in the summer of 2014, my family moved to Los Angeles from New York. It was a big move, but we had moved before and we were up for the challenge. Seven months after we arrived, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. Seven months in a new city is not a lot of time to create the support network one needs in the face of a cancer diagnosis. When I was waiting for the results of my biopsy, my husband, Elon, told me I should call his sister. Why? I asked, well, what can she do? He gently reminded me that she might have some tips to help me as I hadn't really slept since I knew I was having a biopsy. And so I called her. 
Indeed, Shira, my sister-in-law, and Shar Sherat had so much to offer, not just me, but my family. They helped in ways I didn't know I needed, that we needed. They gave my husband a support package that helped him understand what I was going through and how he could best help me. He gave me language to explain to my teenage children what was happening. They connected me with women who had a similar diagnosis so I could talk with them about what the surgery I was facing and its recovery would be like. Doctors can tell you a lot, but unless they have experienced the surgery, their understanding of the recovery can be, well, let's just say spotty. After treatment, Sharsharit sent me a survivorship packet, which included lots of information about post-cancer healthy lifestyle. Exercise, meditation, and nutrition were highlighted. There was even a cookbook. Now I am a peer supporter and I'm able to help women like me who need someone who has walked the road before them to listen, to answer questions, and to be a part of their community. I was paired with a woman in New Jersey who during her treatment would call sometimes with questions, sometimes with complaints, and sometimes with the small victories that a woman recovering can experience. Something like, I was able to shower, wash, and dry my hair unassisted today. I'm not a therapist, I, I don't even play one on TV, but I do know what it's like to be in the thick of cancer. And it is a blessing to be able to listen and cheer on someone the way I received that encouragement when I needed it. Every time I speak about Sharsheret, someone will come up to me after to disclose that they or a family member recently had a diagnosis or found out they had a genetic mutation. Should she call Sharsheret? Yes, I answer. Recently this happened and I received the following email. Dear Annie, I wanna thank you again. The Sharsheret team has been amazing. They are sending me a Freda packet and a box of toys for my eight-year-old. I have spoken with someone three times since yesterday and she is sending me a children's story for my eight-year-old daughter, Butterfly Kisses. Thank you so much for connecting me with them. It really helped me start moving in a positive direction. It's not a matter of if you know someone who will be affected by breast or ovarian cancer. It's a question of who and when, but I am here to say it is very comforting to know that Sharsherit is here to be a part of the care team for that woman and her family, and that they are only a phone call away. Thank you, Annie, for, for sharing your inspiring story with us today and for your incredible support of Sharsherit. We're so lucky to have your involvement and you've helped so many women along the way um, and families. Um, if you're interested in finding out more about the resources that Annie mentioned, our peer support network, the busy box for families with young children, our caregiver packet, our thriving again kit, or our kit for newly diagnosed women, please contact clinical staff at charsherit.org. And we all know that the end of the year celebrations are often filled with delectable sweet and sugary treats. It can be a hard time to feel motivated to eat on the healthier side. That's why we're so excited to have today's guest demonstrate a few delicious, lighter, sugar-free desserts we can make at our upcoming holiday meals. Paula Scheuer, the kosher baker, is the author of The Healthy Jewish Kitchen, The Holiday Kosher Baker, The Kosher Baker, The New Passover Menu, and The Instant Pot Kosher Cookbook. And as a side note, stay tuned to the end of the webinar as we are excited to give away Paula's cookbook, the Healthy Jewish Kitchen, Fresh Contemporary Recipes for Every Occasion, there you, you, you saw it, uh, to three lucky winners who fill out today's evaluation. Paula has a French pastry degree from Paris and does cooking events all around the world. She has taught over 187 virtual cooking classes. She is a freelance writer, cookbook editor, and brand ambassador for food companies. Paula competed on Food Network's Sweet Genius and has appeared on TV over 48 times. Paula, welcome to Share Shared in the Kitchen and thank you so much for being here today. Thank you, Jessica, for that lovely introduction. And Annie, it was very powerful to hear your story as well. I wanna dedicate this class today to the memory of my best friend, Susan Glickman, who passed away from breast cancer about seven years ago and who first taught me about Shar Sherritt. And her motto always was, eat desserts first. So I have, you know, there were many times when she and I together would plan on a meal, but we'd always start with ice cream. Sometimes we'd have a meal and sometimes we would just eat ice cream. So 
Uh, today, I'm going to teach you delicious but healthier recipes. You know, I am working with some white flour. I'm using some sweeteners. These aren't like 100% devoid of anything that has calories. But my whole approach has always been like you just have to move a step forward in a healthier direction, and that is how you will become, you know, healthier yourself. So very quickly, I just wanted to talk about my food story. And what I mean by a food story is every one of you has experiences with food your whole life, meals in your mother, grandmother's, aunt's kitchens, meals you fed your children, first meals you cooked when you were in college off campus or when you got married. Remember when we used to travel and taste food everywhere we went? So all of those memories become your food story. My own food story goes back to my grandmother's kitchen in Brooklyn when I was 12 years old. And I would sit at the counter in that pink and yellow kitchen, very 1970s, and I would watch her measure cake ingredients with her hands. And it was some kind of great magic because my mother only baked once a year with those Manischewitz cake mixes on Passover. So it was so great to be in grandma's kitchen and I would just watch her create just wonderful, wonderful dessert. Now, growing up in Long Island in the 70s, early 80s, I never imagined food was a career. I went to college at Brandeis to become a doctor, ended up in law school after a chemistry accident. And after practicing law for four years in DC, my husband's work sent us to Geneva, Switzerland, where I had a job as a speechwriter for a Jewish organization. After my daughter Emily was born, I decided to, to leave that job, went to cooking school in Paris just for fun. I wasn't planning on a new career. I just thought I'd learn how to eat better. And then I started catering in my small kitchen in Geneva. And people, a woman in the Jewish community asked me to teach cooking classes for a, fun, for a Jewish women's organization. And that began my love of teaching. And about 35 years after sitting in the kitchen with my grandmother, I get an email from a woman in Brooklyn asking me if I would teach a cooking class in her rabbi's house. By then I was traveling the world teaching and people would recommend me to different groups and that's how I built my whole business. So I saw where the email was from. I called this woman on the phone and I say to her, am I gonna teach this class at 3844 Lime Avenue in Seagate, Brooklyn? And a shocked woman says, how do you know the address of my rabbi's house? So I tell her that that house was my former grandparents' house. And I taught a cooking class in the same kitchen where my grandmother taught me to, to cook and bake. And my mother, my aunt, my daughter, my dad were all there. I thought it would be overwhelmed because grandma was already gone. She had lived to age 98 on a steady diet of sponge cake and Sanka. But when I stood up in front of that group, holding the kosher baker in my hands, which took five years to get out into the world, I knew that that's what I was meant to be doing. All right, let's get into our first recipe. So the first thing we're going to make is a galette dough. It is super simple. I'm making it in the food processor, but you could do it by hand too. This recipe is from the kosher baker. There is no sugar in the dough or the filling. If you wanna sprinkle sugar on top later or a sugar substitute, you can. I'm gonna ask uh, my tech people to kind of highlight my other screen. And I'm just gonna kind of move right over here so you can watch me, perfect. Okay, so I'm gonna make this in a food processor. And the reason why I do this is that we're trying to cut fat into the dry ingredients. So I've got my all-purpose flour here, and you could use a gluten-free substitute if you want. I'm a big fan of or blends by Orly, which you can get on um, Amazon. They have a, a blend, different blends for cookies, for cakes, for challah, so it's really great. And you can use pretty much any fat you want. It's six tablespoons. I have used Coconut oil, if you use coconut oil, I would freeze it first. You measure out the tablespoons. Here I'm using like a plant-based, but they call it plant-based butter. You can use any kind of a dairy-free or you can make it with butter too. And the idea behind making a flaky pie crust is that you wanna have pieces of fat that don't get completely smushed. So what we're going to be doing here, we're basically just going to like pulse, pulse this like 10 times just to start cutting the fat into the dry ingredients. So the, the margarine are still in big pieces. Don't worry about that. Because basically what happens in the oven is if you have little pebbles of fat among your dry ingredients, in the oven they melt and they press up against the dry ingredients. And that's what creates those wonderful 
flaky areas of any kind of a biscuit, scone, or pastry dough, or pie dough. This is a great method to make any kind of um, any kind of pie for Thanksgiving. So I'm just adding one egg yolk. When you're baking, we're just baking with large eggs. And I'm gonna go ahead and add one tablespoon of ice water. So you just take a butter. Uh, and the reason we're using the ice water is that we don't want our fat to melt. So now that I've put this in, I'm gonna pulse it five times. I'm gonna add my second tablespoon of ice water in here. Try to avoid the ice cubes, but that's not terrible either. And now I'm gonna add my third tablespoon of ice water. So now I'm gonna mix it and I will show you the different stages of it. First, it's gonna look like, like couscous basically, and then it'll come together. And once it's clumps, then it's done. So as you watch it, and I will show this to you guys in a second, you'll see like it starts to kind of come together, kind of clumpy, but we want it a little bit more clumps. We don't need it to completely come together. So if a recipe tells you, oh, I have to have like all the dough has to come together, you don't really need to do that. All right, so now that I see it starting to clump up, so I see a couple of spots there. All right, we're done here. So I'm gonna tilt this so you can see this. Now, if I picked up the dough and put it in my hand, it looks like per normal pie dough. So I'm gonna take this off and let me quickly get this out of the way. Now you can make this dough, you know, a week, weeks or months in advance. So if I'm hosting Thanksgiving, my tart and pie doughs are done, you know, kind of, I don't know, weeks beforehand. I'm gonna take a, a piece of plastic wrap and just put it on my counter. Got a little crumpled. Hopefully I won't have to take another one. There we go. So you're just gonna take a plastic wrap. Always go ahead and take the, the blade out so that you don't risk hurting yourself. Now I started doing sugar-free desserts because my dad was a diabetic and he loved his desserts, I tell you. So I'm basically, and you see how it's not coming together, but I'm gonna quickly kind of turn it over here onto here. See if I can get it all out, good, good, good. And now watch what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna take the sides of my plastic wrap and press it together and bring this dough together. So I'm just kind of lifting and smushing. Smushing is a very sophisticated French baking technique I learned in cooking school. So you see, now it looks like a regular piece of dough. Now, whenever you're gonna put dough in the freezer to chill, you don't want it to be a ball, you don't want it to be like a, like a hockey puck, you want it to be more like a pancake. So what I do is I wrap it loosely and I press it down like this, since we're gonna roll this out soon, I'm gonna press it even thinner than usual. And now I've got this pancake and I'm just gonna stick this in the freezer while I do the next recipe. Paula, there was a question that came in. If you make the crust ahead of time and freeze it, how do you defrost it in the fridge okay. or long? Okay, so what I typically will do if I'm going to roll out the dough is I'll take it out of the freezer and put it on if you have a granite countertop because the countertop will absorb the cold from the, from the dough and help it thaw. It only has, you only have to thaw it until when you press the top of the dough, your finger goes in a little bit. As long as your finger can be pressed in, start rolling out the dough. And if it's really hard, you can bang it with a rolling pin, which is really fun to do. And that way it'll help kind of, you know, help you stretch out your dough. And if you're ever rolling out dough and it starts to get really sticky to your rolling pin and your, your whatever you're rolling it on, your parchment, just take whatever you've rolled, put it on a cookie sheet and stick it right back in the freezer and let it freeze. I'm grabbing my mixer for the pumpkin cake. Now I have the, the galette that, dough that I just showed you and the galette is like an open face tart. I have another version of this in Healthy Jewish Kitchen where the dough has chocolate in it. So it has less white flour. It does need sugar in the dough to balance out the, um, the, the bitterness of the chocolate. But you should know that even when I make this tart regularly and I'm not worried about sugar-free, I still don't put any sugar in the dough because you just don't need to. You just wanna have flavor inside. So I'm just gonna get all this ready to go. I've got this great clear mixing bowl, which I got when I started doing Zoom cooking classes. Okay, so let's get ready. Let me move these out of the way. 
Now the pumpkin bread is basically what I call just kind of a, you know, really classic one bowl dessert. And it's, um, everybody needs those in their arsenal. arsenal. My kosher baker cookbook is organized by time. So the first section of the book are one step recipes. There's like 35 one bowl cakes, one bowl cookies. So easy, easy. Second part is two step desserts and then three step desserts. Because I think when you think about what you're baking, you think about how much time you have. Is it Friday at three or is it Wednesday night? It's a very different dessert you're making if it's Friday at three and you're like, oh no, I need a dessert. Okay, so we are going to start with, I have a loaf pan over here. For this recipe, I'm using one of these longer loaf pans. It's a 12 inch. So if you were going to make this, you could also make it in a bunt and then you would probably bake it for more like 55 minutes or an hour. But you know, I have this one of these great nonstick pans. I'm gonna spray it with the spray oil that already has flour. And whenever you're greasing any, any pan, grease it more than you think. This one is kind of gloppy a little bit because it has the flour in it, but it really helps everything pop out. So whenever you're greasing a pan, a bun pan, like be a little more generous than you think. It'll save you from having problems later. Okay, so I'm gonna start with, I've got oil. Now for this recipe, I'm using agave, but you could also use maple syrup as well. And I'm going to add all my kind of liquid ingredients first. I've got vanilla. I've got three eggs. Paula, what can you use instead of the, the spelt flour? Oh, okay. So the flours that I'm using in this recipe can be substituted with any flour. So I could not find the white whole wheat flour. So I'm using regular whole wheat flour that I mix with a little bit of white flour. You could do this all with white flour. You could combine it half white and half whole wheat flour. I've done this one different ways. So I'm gonna mix this for about 30 seconds or so. And this recipe is from the Holiday Kosher Baker. I will show you that one. This is my book that's organized by Jewish holidays. It's got 37 gluten-free recipes in it and 45 Passover recipes. So it's um, it's one that I, I guess I go back and forth between both books. You can ask me which book I like better. It's like asking me which one of my four children I love the most. I guess it depends on the day. All right, so now I'm adding my pumpkin puree and this is just canned pumpkin. If you wanted to cook a pumpkin or sweet potato, you could use that as well. And we're gonna get that mixed in. I've been playing around with pumpkin recently. I've been working on a pumpkin focaccia which I'll probably post in the next day or so. All right, so now I'm ready to go ahead and add all my dry ingredients. So I will go add those one at a time. So my Healthy Jewish Kitchen Cookbook is like very, very dear to me. That book came out in 2017. And I always joke that like, that's how you're supposed to, this is the spelt and that was the whole wheat, that that is how you're supposed to eat so that you always have room for dessert. I'm adding salt baking powder, baking soda, and I'm adding a bunch of spices here, but if there are any of the spices that you don't like as much, like you could skip it. I mean, there's cloves and cinnamon and um, cloves and cinnamon and ginger and nutmeg. So I'm gonna go ahead and put those in and I'm gonna just mix this, all this together. So I think I started saying this, I'm not sure if I finished that the Healthy Jewish Kitchen is how you're supposed to eat so that there's always room for dessert. And that book has my most viral recipe to date, which is my chocolate quinoa cake, which does have a fair amount of sugar in it, but it's completely gluten-free. It's a great Passover recipe. The Food 52 blog featured it, called it a genius recipe, and they 
created a video of how to make it that got like 63,000 views. Now, no matter what mixer you have or you're mixing by hand, always check the bottom because sometimes the, the whisk or the hook, it just doesn't get there. Okay, I think we're good here. I'm gonna take this out. So about six years ago, yeah, six years ago, my publisher came to me and asked me if I would write a kosher cookbook that emphasized a healthy approach. And because she knew that I'm not, you know, overweight, I'm fit, and, you know, kind of wondered, like, how is it that I can do that with all the desserts that I'm creating all of the time? And, um, hey, I will tell you, my everybody, that's like the number one question I used to get when I did events in person, was people, I would show up and people would think I can't, couldn't possibly be a good baker if I wasn't obese. They, they kept saying to me, well, you don't eat these dessert, but I, I actually do. I'm just gonna go ahead and scoop this in here. And before I tell you my secret, I will just tell you about baking times. This is like the most important thing I'm gonna tell you today. So if you like forget every single thing I've said, I want you to remember this. Hold on a second. Everybody's ovens are different. If you've ever gone on vacation and used a different oven or visited a family member and made your challah and you're having trouble getting it right, it's because ovens really are different. So 350 on one oven is not necessarily 350 on another oven. So how do we, how do we account for that? So my rule of thumb is we reduce baking time. So the first time you make a recipe, my recipe, anyone's recipe, reduce the baking time. If the recipe says bake something for an hour, you bake it for 50 minutes, a cake for 40 minutes, bake it for 30. Cookies for 16 minutes or 14 minutes, do it from 12 to 14 minutes. Then you can check it. You can always add more time rather than take it away. So like my recipe here says 45 minutes and I would probably tell you, okay, just time it, you know, for 40 or so. All right, so now that I've got this in here, yeah, go ahead. A uh, question came in, do you always use the whisk for cakes instead of the paddle? I do, I do. For some reason, I find that the whisk just distributes all the ingredients that much better. And if I'm making a cake, adding air to it is a good thing. And would adding sugar-free chocolate chips change the cooking time or amounts of other ingredients? No, it would make it really yummy. Uh, I I'm think a that's big a great fan. idea. <laughs> oh my God, my, mo my mother only ate chocolate dessert. She used to hide a chocolate fudge cake in the kitchen. I mean, in her closet. There was one in the kitchen for my brothers and me, but literally she had her own cake in her bedroom. Okay, so one of the things, just a quick tip for something like this. I'll put this down so it's not as loud. So I've got my cake in here. Whoops, you kind of drop it a few times so that there's no like holes in it. Okay, now I'm gonna go ahead and bake it in my 350 oven. And we're just baking it until we can take a skewer out and the skewer is clean. And I'm gonna show you something. This is also like a really general baking tip, okay? So basically, if I am baking and I wanna check to see how a cake is, um, how a cake has baked, I'm not gonna use a toothpick, okay? Um, because a toothpick is only gonna tell you this much about your cake. So I hold on, I keep these in my oven mitt drawer. I've got, you know, like if I can find the smaller ones, they take up less space or skewers because this will tell you what's going on in the whole cake. And when you're testing the cake, you wanna stick it in like on an angle so that you get like, a, you know, the middle part of the cake, not the bottom, which would be close to the heat anyway. So that's my great tip. So I find you can get them in the supermarket in the summer because everyone's making kebabs, I guess. So go ahead and stock up on those because they're really, really great. Okay, very quickly, I was telling you about the Healthy Jewish Kitchen. I will do that while I'm getting my other recipe ready to go. I'm gonna show you how to make profiteroles. And I'm gonna do that on a portable burner. So I'm gonna get that warmed up. Let me go get my saucepan here. And if you don't know what profiteroles are, it's basically the, the pastry that you use for eclairs. It's called a shoe pastry and it's a cooked pastry. It's real, I find it's really fun to make. 
And normally people would fill it with ice cream and chocolate sauce, but, and you can fill these with anything. We're gonna fill it with fruit today. But if you got sugar-free, dairy-free, any kind of ice cream that you can have, it's really fun to do that. They've even made them for parties. All right, I'm just trying to heat up the burner here and then I'm ready to go. Let me make sure I have everything. There we go. Oh, and a quick word about pans. I'm just gonna show you this quickly. So whenever you're using any kind of a cookie sheet, you want it to be sturdy and light colored. If you have those really old, really dark pans, they're going to heat up more than a lighter color pan. And then you're gonna have a problem with um, your cookies baking. And if you ever make a cookie recipe, the first time you make them, bake four cookies and see how long it takes till they, they come out the way you want them. And take cookies that you want to be chewy cookies, you should have to take them out of the oven when you press the top of the cookie, your finger only goes halfway through. All right, so this is ready to go. I've got parchment paper on here. Okay, and you know what? I'm gonna get these in the oven and then I'm gonna tell you the story. Okay, let's come back over here. All right, so we're making the profiteroles. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm putting in water and any, I'm, I'm making this dairy free. So I'm using almond milk today, but you could use soy milk is, is great as well. All right, and I've got, I'm turning the heat up here. And what I'm going to do as well is add four tablespoons of like butter or kind of a plant-based margarine. I'm just gonna cut these in here. And I'm just gonna add my salt here. And we're gonna bring this to a boil. Like I said, it's like a cooked dough. So here's my little bit of salt there. Okay, so while that's ready, I'm getting out my other ingredients. Well, a question came in about the um, pumpkin bread. It, does it matter if you use a round pan instead of a rectangular pan? Right, if you use a round pan, um, yeah, it may take just a little bit longer. It's kind of, it, it, it may dome up a little bit. You know, that's why you have to check them. Like you have the skewers, you have to check it. But depending on the size of the pan, I think this amount of batter, I'd probably, I might put in two small pans, turn into a layer cake. But if you put it into one, you know, just watch the middle. If you ever have a cake where the top is starting to burn too much, but when you stick the skewer in, it's still too gooey, then you want to maybe take some foil and you can do this with challahs too, like drape it over in the oven so that it will um, stop browning on top. Okay, good, this is melting, this is great. My timer for my my uh, my galetto, oops, still soft, I'll give it a few more minutes. Okay, great. If you also, I didn't say this, if you take your dough out of the oven, I mean, uh, out of the freezer and it's just hard as a rock, but you really need to roll it out, I've even put it in the microwave under defrost just very briefly. So right where what I'm trying to do here is melt the fat and bring the milk and water to a boil. I've made this with whole milk, fat-free milk, a lot of different ways. And it just all seems to work. There was a question that came in earlier about how do you know which kind of milk to use, whether it's almond or coconut or oat or... So I use soy milk for years just because to me, soy milk is kind of thick. It's more like whole milk. Almond milk, depending on the brand, could be more like fat-free or 1% milk. So, you know, depending on what you're substituting for. Like if you were substituting for cream, like something like half and half, I'd probably want to use soy milk for that. But people have very lots of different sensitivities and allergies. So people should find whichever one works for them. All right, so the, the, the fat is almost melted and then we're gonna, it's gonna boil. And then we're gonna go ahead and add our flour. It's kind of an interesting process, but this is a really fun dough to learn how to make. Okay, so here we go. Here my, my mixture is boiling. And when I say boiling, you want it to be a rolling boil. Not the, you know, bubbling that your kids see, a teeny amount of bubbles, you know, when they're first learning to cook pasta and they wonder like, why? Why can't they put the pasta in? So this is a rolling boil with all the fat melted. I'm just gonna remove this from the heat over here. And I'm gonna go ahead and add my half a cup of flour to it. And you're gonna see it like an interesting transformation here. The mixture is gonna basically turn into like mashed potatoes. 
got to turn this down and let me turn this lower here because I only need a very, I'm just trying to dry out the dough. So you basically want to make sure you don't see any of the flour and you're going to stir it on the heat till it comes together into a ball. So you see, I'm not using like any fancy tools here. I'm just mixing this up. So you see how it's like coming off the sides now? It's coming together. And you just want to dry it out for a little bit, maybe 30 seconds, maybe a minute or so. And I'm just smushing it on the bottom to just make sure that the dough has dried out a bit. And we're good. All right, so I'm gonna turn this off. I'm gonna move this out of the way. Let me put it down on something and then I'll show you what we're gonna do next. How we turn this into this fabulous, fabulous dough. It's so nice to have the, the burners that you can move around. I know, I need, yeah, I need to get the, you know, like a single one. Mm -hmm. I went and bought an induction one, but it wasn't working. Okay, so now I've dumped the dough into the bowl. And now we need to add eggs to it, but I'm sure you guys will all know that we can't put, you know, kind of eggs into this hot, hot dough this moment. So basically what I do is, and for this, you really want a wooden spoon. Now you could do this next part of the recipe with the paddle in the machine, but I like to do it by hand because I find it's like a really good, you know, kind of arm workout. A question came in about making, uh, whether or not this can be made gluten-free. I would do this with gluten-free flour. Yes, you can definitely make these gluten-free. I've made these for Passover with, I'm trying to remember what I used for them. Um, I probably used, you know, kind of a combination of potato starch and cake meal. All right, so I'm just stirring it up so it cools down a little bit. And whenever you're stirring anything, if it's moving around your counter, just put it on top of a, of a dish towel so that it will cool down. All right, I'm gonna give this one minute to cool down and I'm just gonna tell you my quick secret to staying in shape, okay? So I call this the secret of the four S's, okay? You can adopt some of them, they don't have to be yours, I'm just sharing mine because it's the question I always got asked the most. So the first S is sweat. I exercise a lot. I started running when I was 48, did two half marathons for charities and now I can't do that anymore, I still can run but do something, right? Like exercise, especially on Fridays. We all eat too much on Shabbat. We just can't help it. It's all there, there's challah. It's just the foods are delicious that we've created that our friends are sharing with us. So just do whatever, even if it's just walking in your house and depending on your health issues, like you figure out as long as you can do something safely, just move, okay? So that's my kind of number one is sweat. The second S is salad. I eat a lot of salad. I don't eat bagels and lasagna. I typically have salad with tuna, salad with an egg, salad with leftover chicken or beef. I, if I know I'm eating a heavy meal in the evening, my lunch is gonna be very light. Today's lunch was homemade sourdough bread with some avocado and scrambled eggs. And I was very excited about that. So, you know, kind of all natural, nothing processed. So try to add more healthy food into your diet. And I'm never gonna preach to you. I'm never gonna tell you it's all or nothing. It's just balancing out the things you wanna treat yourself with where, with other lighter food. So the third S is to be selective. We've all been to a wedding, bar mitzvah or party where there's some beautiful looking pastries. You take a bite, they taste terrible. Don't eat it. If you follow me around a kiddish, you will see what I call the graveyard of desserts. One bite has been taken out of every one of them and I don't finish it. If there's a cookie that isn't worth eating, put the cookie down. That cookie out of a package, just don't finish it. Like just don't. So only eat desserts that are truly worth the calories. Now the fourth S was my secret it has become much less relevant during COVID. And my fourth secret is Spanx. All right, so now we've got our dough here. And now we're gonna start mixing in an egg. So I'm gonna dump, pour in one egg here. I once told that joke with my rabbi in attendance and he had no idea what I was talking about. Now you see when you start mixing this egg into the dough, it's kind of annoying. It doesn't really mix, but just keep mixing. Just keep mixing, smushing, the, the egg will get mixed in. And you have to do them one at a time. And once one is mixed in, you can go ahead and add the next one. So the Healthy Jewish Kitchen book was 
not one that I had gone out wanted to write, but my publisher asked me if I would write this book. But the time when she approached me about doing this book, you see how it's now all mixed in? Now I can go ahead and add the next one. As long as you see nothing shiny, you can mix in the second egg. So when I got this request to write this healthy cookbook, it was about six weeks after my mother passed from a 12 week battle with lung cancer. And I was spending every night after Minion on the sofa over there with my two best friends, Ben and Jerry, eating my feelings. I know some of you have been there too. And I mean, I knew that I couldn't stay on that sofa forever and I really love writing cookbooks. So I agreed to write, I agreed to write this cookbook and I started taking recipes that I grew up with and just taking, you know, making them so much lighter. I abandoned ingredients I had relied on for years, like margarine and puff pastry and jarred barbecue sauce. I didn't use any of that. Everything was natural in the book. And what happened was I started losing the grieving weight and I started to feel hopeful again. People loved my recipes and I was bringing joy to people. I had purpose and hope from working on this project. So this, so writing The Healthy Jewish Kitchen, like, you know, kind of brought me back to life and really saved me. Sadly, my father passed away as the book went to press. So the book is dedicated to both of their memories and there's lots of stories of my family in that book. All right, so you see, I've got this nice batter here. It's actually a little bit thicker than I would like. So yeah, so the, this is gonna come together into a batter and now we're going to pipe it out. Okay, so let me show you what I've done here. I've got my parchment paper over my nice heavy pan and look what I have here. These are disposable pastry bags that you can buy from Wilton or other companies and I have like a tip with like a half an inch. Oh, I like using these. You can get the ones that have the, the coppers on it, but these professional ones are great. And you can get them online, like the restaurant depot kind of places has them. So I'm going to turn this inside out. When I was doing my Zoom classes for kids last summer and last year, we did a lot of work with pastry bags. So it's really good to do it, you know, like everything else. You have no idea what you're doing, and then one day you just become an expert. For anybody who is, um, you know, wanting, we are compiling a list of recommendations and tips that Paula is making throughout the program, and we will be sending that out the recording um, in the next week or so. All right, I think I've got as much as I need to get out here. We're good. All right, sometimes if you have to do this in two batches, but I think I'm fitting it all in. Okay, so how do we work with a pastry bag? First thing we do. We try to keep the outside clean. So do your best to get whatever uh, icing, whatever it is, lift up the top. Anytime you're going to use a pastry bag, you kind of hold it from the top, squeeze down the air, and squeeze out a little bit. Then I twist it one time, two times, okay, and let the cut off the extra. You see how it's like comfortably sitting in my hand like this? So now I've got, I can squeeze out with one hand. Pastry bags are not a two-handed operation. Another little trick I learned in cooking school, especially if you if you have a convection oven, in which case you would probably bake these for 25 degrees less, look what you can do. You can hold down your parchment this way with you just using a little bit of batter. Okay, so now we're gonna make our pastries. I guess I'll start in the middle because it's easier for me here. Oh, I'm gonna need that. Oh, I have a little bowl here, it's fine. Okie doke, okay. So whenever I'm doing macaroons or anything I want, or um, meringues, basically what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use this hand to kind of guide me, and I'm gonna squeeze it out to the size I want. For this recipe, I like them on the bigger side, and then lift up. So I'll show it again. I'm putting the tip about, I don't know, like a half an inch above the, above the parchment and then I squeeze in the middle, squeeze, 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 so I totally see the size I want and then I lift it up. I've taught, you know, 11 year olds how to do this on Zoom. So I'm telling you, you can do it. It was really fun like watching kids, you know, try to do what I was teaching them. I've done, I taught crepe making on Zoom, which was fun. I have a 
I did a lot of bat mitzvahs, which was fun. My one of my most, my, I guess my most popular zooms were black and white cookies, challah, and babka. So for this recipe, I'm making these on the bigger side, but I can make them smaller too. And let me explain how you, this majorly makes 16, so I'm making them just bigger in the interest of time. They take a little longer to bake. Kind of squeezing this out. All right, there we go. Okay, so one more step. I'm gonna take another egg and beat it. If you're ever working on recipes where you need beaten egg, like challah, glazing your challah, and you know you might make something else, like I would hold on to your leftover glazed egg for like a day or two in case you make something out, make something else that needs it so that you don't have to waste. And usually all I do, it's very gentle, just gently do this. You can make these smaller if you want. So, so these I've decided to make them a little bit bigger today. And I'm gonna put them in a 475 oven and immediately turn the oven off. And I leave them like that for about 10, 15 minutes to let them steam. Then I turn the oven back on to 350 and just cook them until the color is right. So I'm gonna go ahead. Can you guys see these? I'll hold them up really close. So these are what they will look like. These are bigger than you might kind of typically make. And I'm putting them in my oven and I'm turning my oven off for 15 minutes. And I'm gonna go ahead and check on my galette. Let's see if we're ready to roll that out. We are ready to roll it out. Okay, so I will explain to you kind of how I know this is ready to roll out. And I'm gonna teach you all my like tart and pie rolling tips so that when you guys, if you guys are making any pies for Thanksgiving, um, I also want to tell you my charcuterie pies for prevention story. So, when my mother passed away six years ago, um, or your site was last week, it was during, we were sitting shiver during Thanksgiving. And there was like a really big kind of debate among my brothers and me, like what we should do for Thanksgiving. Like, should we celebrate? Should we not? What should we do? We don't want to celebrate during Shiva. But my four children, my kids are between the ages of 21 and uh, 26. They wanted Thanksgiving food. It was really important to them. So somebody decided to donate Thanksgiving food. But I, my brothers didn't really love that idea. One lived in Israel, so Thanksgiving wasn't as big a deal for him. But my kids just insisted on the food. So I told the friends, let me just show you what I'm doing in the meantime. Um, I will finish the story, my pie story in a second. So here's flour, here's my parchment paper. This is how you sprinkle flour for any purpose. People don't know how to do this. I pick it up with my fingers, I hold it about a foot and I rub my fingers together like it's raining. Okay, I'm not rubbing it on, I'm not dumping it on. People use way too much. Okay, make it rain. Okay. And you can see the dough here. So when I put my finger on it, I can press it in. If I know I can press it, then I know I can roll it. So my sister-in-law and my mother-in-law decided that they were gonna be the ones who would order the Thanksgiving food for us. So I, my marching orders were, we don't need every kind of Thanksgiving everything, just some turkey, some stuffing, vegetables were fine. But what showed up was an entire Thanksgiving dinner. And then, and then at Minion that night, a woman came in who I grew up with, who I hadn't seen, who was a breast cancer survivor herself. And she walked in with a pie. And it just, and it ended up being such a beautiful thing for my family that we had this Thanksgiving dinner during this really difficult week. And they kept asking me, do we have a pie? Do we have a pie? And I said, I don't have a pie. And they were kind of sad about that until our Shoshara pie showed up. And uh, for my kids, kind of saved the evening for them. All right, so let me show what, I, what I'm doing. I have my parchment, my dough, a little bit of flour, and I'm putting parchment on top. I always roll my dough out between two pieces of parchment. Now, if your dough is too hard, you can always bang it. Remember I mentioned that earlier? It's kind of fun. And I always call making a galette kind of pies for dummies because it's just, you don't have to make a fancy design. And what's nice about rolling between two pieces of parchment is you can keep turning the parchment to roll in different directions. I use this plant place margarine that I don't typically use, and every once in a while you can lift it up and sprinkle a teeny bit more on top. Now, the idea is to have it kind of, to have it round the best you can. And I usually say I roll it out to about 
I don't know, 12 or 13 inches. I have a lot of measurements in my recipes, which is why, da-da, I keep a ruler in the kitchen. That way I can measure and see when somebody says, or I, my recipe says, roll out the babka to, you know, nine by 12, I know what that is. Now, this is important. When you're rolling out pie dough or tart dough, don't roll over the edge. And this is true for babka too. Because if you roll all the way over, the ends become thinner and the middle's really thick. So if you just stop before the edge, then your dough will be rolled out evenly. Now, another one of my little tricks is, probably once during this process, I turn the whole packet over, make sure the bottom isn't sticking, because if the bottom sticks, I can't stretch it out. I'll put a little bit more flour here and turn it back over. And there's a fair amount of, you know, a fat in the recipe, so you're really okay if you end up adding a little bit of flour to it. Oh, well, there were a couple of questions. Oh, sorry. Of course, go ahead. Good. No, it's a, a good time questions. for questions. Great. Uh, one came in that said, can you use a KitchenAid for egg mixing? Um, somebody can't do it by hand. Hundred, Of course. You mean for glazing over the egg or mixing the eggs into the dough? Um, maybe, maybe both. Yeah, you can you can definitely do something. Be, you know, you can get the uh, immersion blenders have like a whisk attachment, and that would be really really great for somebody who really had a hard time doing things by hand to use. Oh, that's a great suggestion. Yeah, uh, there was another question that came in um, regarding the profiteroles. Um, you take it out of the oven when it gets to three fifty. Okay, so this is what I did. I put them in the oven, they're on at four, I'm gonna put the light on here. I will show it to you guys at some point. I turned the oven off for like, whatever, like 10 minutes or so, and then I'm gonna turn it back on and then they'll bake. So I have them like puff up first and then bake. Got it. But I'm gonna turn it, I'm gonna turn it back on to 350 shortly. All right, I think we're good here. Now, whenever you're rolling out the dough for this, just do your best. Like I feel that this part is a little bit thicker, so I'm gonna roll it out a little bit more here and make it a little bit more round. If your dough looks like Australia, that is not a terrible thing. Just do your best, okay? So what's really nice about this recipe, it's like really forgiving. Okay, so now let's get our fruit ready. I don't always love to do the fruit in advance because it gets really mushy. So I have here three cups of raspberries, blackberries, and blueberries. Um, I have, you could do all of one recipe, all of one. You could use um, all, you know, I've combined every kind of fruit I have. If you're gonna use apples or pears, I would pre-cook them before putting them into this. So normally I mix cornstarch with sugar, but here I'm just gonna add the cornstarch. And what the cornstarch does, got a little stuck in here, is it, it absorbs some of the liquid so it doesn't all ooze out. Oozing is not a terrible thing. So all I'm doing is stirring it until the cornstarch kind of disappears into the fruit. Now, remember we had an egg yolk in the dough. I have an egg white over here that I'm gonna use to brush the top of it. So if it's the summertime, you're gonna to wanna to make this with plums or peaches, just kind of whatever you have. Do you use and frozen I just, berries? You could use frozen berries, but I would probably, you might add a little bit more kind of cornstarch because those will be, they might be a little bit more liquidy. Okay, so here comes the fun part here. And I have the oven preheated. I'm gonna bake this at about 425. Okay, so at this part, I'm gonna dump the fruit into the middle here. And we wanna do that, but kind of leave a border. Now, if you're mixing up fruit, if you're mixing up fruit, if you see that like all the raspberries or all the blackberries are in one place and the blueberries are in another, just kind of move them around a little bit. So just kind of do your best. So try to leave about, I don't know, about a two inch border or so. We wanna make sure that we have, you know, everybody gets the same fruit in every bite. Okay, something like this. Let me just wipe off my hands. So this part is kind of fun. I'm basically gonna take my dough and like do like pleats, like fold it over the fruit and go around in a circle like this. I have a friend who lives in um, in West Hampton in Long Island, and I know every time I visit, basically my ticket to entry is I have to make two of these tarts. I've made them with rhubarb and strawberry. I've made them with, I don't know, nectarine, just kind of whatever we, we have. Because they look really pretty. 
Yeah, it looks so pretty. Whoops, uh-oh. All right, it's okay. I'm gonna fix that. Okay, so see, gentle, gentle, gentle. And here's my last one. And then when you get to this part, you can be like, oh, I wanna make it a little tighter or this side is smaller, so I'll fold it a little bit more in to make it more even. If I'm baking this for a lot of people, then I, want, I don't, I don't wanna make it too tight because I need to get a lot of slices out of it. Okay, and there you go. Like it's just a free form apple tart. No fancy shapes, no lattice. I'm just gonna slide this like on. Here, I'm gonna slide it off my counter right onto my cookie sheet like this. And now I'm gonna get my brush. I found a pink charcherette looking pastry brush. I can't remember what this came from, but I feel like it came from some kind of a hollow bake somewhere, which is very possible. So I'm just gonna beat my, my egg white. And then I'm gonna brush the top of this. So you're basically gonna wanna bake this until it's kind of golden and the fruit is bubbly. So that could be about 30, 35 minutes or so. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and turn my profiteroles back on. I'm gonna show you, um, I'm gonna show you what they look like in a moment. I'm gonna bring the camera over so you can see it. It's really cool, they're nice and puffy. And I'm gonna go ahead and bake this. Now, if I'm making this for like people who can have sugar, I will just sprinkle a little bit of sugar, sprinkle a little bit of sugar on top. You can also use like xylitol or any kind of a sugar substitute. I'm just gonna show you quickly how I do that with sugar, but you could do it with something else. I'm literally, all I'm gonna do is like, we were pinching with the flour before. Like, I don't even have a teaspoon. This is just a teeny amount of sugar. Now, when I wrote the Kosher Baker Cookbook, I was working with sugar substitutes and I wasn't that excited about the flavor of them. So when I wrote the Holiday Kosher Baker, I moved towards low sugar. I'm gonna go get this in the oven. I'm just gonna take my, well, actually, I know what I'm gonna do, hold on. I am going to give you guys a little window into the oven here, if I can make this work. Let's see if I can do this. Here we go, there's the oven. Oh, there we go. Okay, can you guys see the puffs in there? Yes. So you see how they really jump, puffed up, but they don't have any color yet, okay? So they have puffed up, but now I need them to get kind of brown. So I'm just gonna now bake them until they turn brown. All right, so let me talk to you briefly about the compote and then we will wrap up in a moment. Okay, so let me show you what I did earlier today. So for the profiteroles, I have, you know, to put the healthiest thing inside them, I, I made this compote earlier. Now, normally I would make this compote with plums and peaches and apricots, but you know, they're out of season right now. So what was I gonna do? So I went to the store and I'm like, okay, well, I want to get the, the color of the plums. So I put in some raspberries and then I wanted to have the kind of the, some texture. So I have apples and pears. Now, this is just a very class and in, in the color, I just wanna hold this up so you guys can see how gorgeous this is. Yeah. You know, if I put fresh cranberries in this, which I should have, I probably have some. Um, if I put fresh cranberries in this, you'd really turn into a really cool Thanksgiving kind of, a, kind of a dish. Now, this is something I make on a regular basis. So like if I go on vacation or I'm out for a few days and I come home and I look in my fridge and the berries are like a little mushy, but not moldy, the blueberries are soft, I don't really want to eat them raw, I will turn them into a compote. So all I do is, I didn't even add any water to this. I put the, all the fruit in this saucepan, turned on the stove top. As soon as the stove top, I hear that, as soon as I hear the fruit kind of sizzle, I just added a little bit of vanilla. You could do like, like sugar-free vanilla syrup and a little bit of cinnamon in, and I just cook it on medium heat until they're as soft as I want them to be. And that's it. Okay, so like these have some texture. I will show you with a fork. So it has a little, you know, these aren't completely mushy. I want them to hold their kind of shape a little bit. So what I'm going to do with the profiteroles is after they're done, I'm going to kind of take these puffs and open them up and fill them with compote. So those are gonna take a little more time. So I'm not sure you'll be able to see them completely done, but we'll see how it goes. But 
you want them to be really golden and you want them to dry a little bit. So what I like about making these kinds of shells is that you can make them earlier in the day. So let's say you want to serve this for Thanksgiving or for Shabbat, I would make the puffs in the morning and just let them sit out and dry on a cooling rag in an aluminum pan, let them just sit there and make the compote. You could always refrigerate it. You can do that a day or two or longer before. And then when you're ready to serve it, you can warm up the compote and then you just put your fingers like inside the puffs to make open them up and then you fill it up and close it. It's like a sandwich. But know that these puffs, you can also fill them up with ice cream, which is really great. Um, so remember when I was talking to you at the beginning about my food story? The reason I do that is I want everyone to consider their own food stories and what I really implore all of you to do like when you're planning meals is to bring that story to your table. So just like we like to have older people and young people at the table, you should try to have old recipes and young recipes. Old recipes are the recipes that tell your story, that you can make something that reminds you of a person, a place, a time, a special occasion. And when you bring those dishes to the table and share those stories with your guests and your family, you can, you're, it's like, taking the food and elevating it to something truly meaningful. But at the same meal, add something new, a recipe for me that you find in any one of my five cookbooks. And, and you can also find recipes. I have recipes on my website, thekosherbaker.com. I'm on Instagram at kosherbaker. Please, please, please follow me. So I take one of my recipes and start creating new traditions and combining them because there's lots of food trends out there. And there's a lot of viral TikTok-y kind of dishes here and there. But if you, if you design your menu that has a little bit of the old and a little bit of the new, I think it's like while you are kind of nourishing the bodies of the people around your table, you can like nourish their souls at the same time. So mm -hmm. if anybody wants, and I will say this now, and I probably didn't tell Jessica this before, so Jessica is giving away some cookbooks. If anybody wants to buy cookbooks from me, you can message me through the contact page on the kosherbaker.com. I will donate 10% of any, any books that anybody from this group buys to Sharsheret. I've been donating percentages of my book sales since the beginning of COVID and have been feeding the needy kind of all over the country. So, but I will designate Sharsheret is my, my current recipient. So, Please, Hanukkah oh. gifts. Cookbooks are the best. Well, thank you so much, Paula. That's amazing. That's really very, very nice. Thank you. I know I'm watching these and I'm trying to see if I can get one done enough before we say goodbye. But yeah, because I made them, I definitely made them bigger. I just turned the temperature up to just rush them a little bit because I know, I know what they're supposed to look like. And people should know is that as they cook through this week for Thanksgiving and then Hanukkah, once you know me, you can message me like lots of people do an hour before every holiday, an hour before Shabbat, Thanksgiving Day, all day long. The worst thing about Thanksgiving is there is no candle lighting time. So people will message me with pie questions all day long. And, um, and, and Annie, who was on at the beginning, talked about um, my baked latkes, which I'm very proud of. My kids love them. They're in this book. They're so crispy. You can find them online because they've been featured lots of places. I've done them on television shows as well. So um, if I can ever help anyone kind of plan a menu or solve any kind of a cooking or baking problem, like please, please contact me. Oh, thank you so much, Paula. This has been amazing. Um, we will see if, if we get to see the desserts at the end. Um, but in the meantime, we recommend that you follow Paula on social media and that you check out her cookbooks. We put links in the chat. We'll also put them in our follow-up so that you can contact Paula or order her cookbooks or um, follow her Instagram, which is really great. Um, also, oh, and I started doing TikTok, which is like, oh. I felt like I, had, I started doing TikTok videos. My last one was a cranberry sauce from my Instant Pot Kosher Cookbook. This is my most recent book. It's like a lot of comfort food. So if you're an Instant Pot devotee, like I am, my four children love their Instant Pots, let me know. Happy to talk about that too. Amazing. Yeah, the, my Instant Pot has become a really great thing during, uh, during this time, I know. Mm -hmm. um, 
So if you, uh, we want to thank Annie again for sharing her meaningful story. And we also, uh, please, there's the link for the survey, um, a brief evaluation survey in the chat. As I mentioned, we are giving away three copies of Paula's Healthy Jewish Kitchen Cookbook away. If you're interested, please fill out the evaluation to enter the giveaway. Evaluations really do inform our future programming. So thank you so much for just taking a few minutes to fill it out. Uh, we'd love for you to stay connected with Sharsharet via social media on Facebook or at Sharsharet Official on Instagram, where we post about events like these, program updates, and fun ways to get involved. Please never forget that Sharsharet is here for you and your loved ones during this time. We provide emotional support, mental health counseling, and other programs designed to help navigate you through the cancer experience. All are free, completely private, one-on-one, -on -one, and our number is 866-474-2774. And you can also email us at clinicalstaff at Our social workers and genetic counselor are available to each of you you are our priority, so please never hesitate to reach out. Finally, I want to share a few of the exciting webinars we have planned over the next few weeks. Join us this Sunday, November 28th at 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern for a donut demo with Naomi TGIS as she demonstrates how to make the perfect Sufganiyot. Uh, on Tuesday, December 7th at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern, is the next Sharsharet National Book Club with award-winning and best-selling author, Dr. Edith Eager, for a conversation about resilience. And then our next Sharsharet in the Kitchen, we're joining forces with our Shalom Shabbat webinar series for the Zen of Hala Baking on Thursday, December 9th at 5 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Eastern with Dr. Beth Riccanati, who wrote uh, Braided, A Journey of a Thousand Halas, and she is going to demonstrate making challah dough and provide some ideas for healthy ingredient options and discuss the grounding meditative nature of making challah. The link to register for all of the programs are in the chat. And you can also check out our website regularly to see what topics are coming up. Um, so uh, I believe that the, the survey has been put into the chat box again. Um, and uh, I don't know if Paula, if, if we uh, we made it in time or not. Well, uh, let me show you. I, I'm going to show you the get the loaf out and just show you that because that is like just a couple of minutes. But I can show you how we I test it quickly. So let's do Perfect. that briefly. Okay. So let's switch cameras for a moment. So it puffed up really nicely here. So here I'm basically just going to take my my skewer and kind of stick it in and see what happens when it comes out. Oh, look at that, it's completely clean. All right, so this was like five minutes early. I stick it in again, just on an angle so I can make sure I'm not getting inside. Let's see what happens. Oh, see, it's a little too gooey. See, that's why I checked it twice. So now it's gonna go back for five minutes, but you'll see. Now, if you look at this loaf cake, it's not gonna be super pretty. I don't wanna put any sugar, or I could put powdered sugar on if I wanted, but this is the kind of thing that I'm going to slice and bring out to people on a platter already sliced. I'm going to show you what the um, one of the profiteroles, what they look like, even though it's not completely brown yet, because they're not going to get that much bigger. Okay, so take a look at this now. So oh, right wow. now, it's really puffed up, but they're going to yeah. get more golden. So we want them like, kind of like a honey golden um, kind of color. So I'm going to, it's going to take another probably 10, 15 minutes. You really can't over bake them. So I wouldn't worry about that. And just a couple of like, I'll leave you with a couple of quick hacks, okay? So let's say you make a pie for Thanksgiving this week. It won't be one of the pies from Shar Sherry because those are usually beautiful. But if you're making a pie and it doesn't come out as pretty as you like, and you're thinking, now what? This is what you're gonna do. You're gonna get a serving spoon and you're gonna scoop the pie onto plates in the kitchen. And you're gonna bring it out to your family and your guests and you're gonna call it cobbler. Nobody knows what you planned, okay? put a couple of berries on that plate, looks beautiful. Let's say you've made an apple pie and it's almost perfect except the crust, the lattice, the design is cracked in one place. You can actually take apricot jam and kind of brush a little bit on the edges and glue the pastry back together. Powdered sugar covers, covers everything. Chocolate can cover anything. Caramel sauce covers anything. So just realize like that you have to be kind to yourself, okay? like. And don't make excuses. Just bring it out there. No one knows what you plan. Big smile on your face because trust me, if you're making a homemade dessert, 
and it's not perfect, doesn't matter. Because at the end of the day, and this is what I said, I competed on Food Network Sweet Genius back in about 10 years ago. And I should have made it to the third round. Spoiler alert, I was robbed. But the whole day, the judge, Ron Ben Israel, kept telling me how delicious everything was. And he just thought he didn't like that my presentation wasn't fancy enough for that second round. But it, I always say, like, food is not art. It is meant to be consumed. It is meant to be eaten. Like, it's not there to just be on show. And, you know, we all cook for ourselves just, you know, to live, to nourish ourselves, but we bake to share, to comfort, to celebrate. We're not baking a cake because we want a piece of cake. We're roasting a chicken because we're hungry, but we're not baking for ourselves. We bake to share. So please, please use these recipes, any of my recipes to kind of spread love and joy, to make food in my Instant Pot book, soups and stews you can pack up and give to people baked desserts that you can have in your freezer so that if somebody is going through a difficult time and i know many of you have and now you want to pay it forward you've got a cake you've got cookies you've got something to bring to someone to help them have a better day a better week so please when you think about baking think about who you can share it with so i hope everybody has a delicious thanksgiving a joyous and happy hanukkah and, and please stay in touch I love that. Thank you so much, Paula. That was just the perfect way to end. Um, what a lovely sentiment. And, um, you know, thank you all for being here. We wish you a happy Thanksgiving and a wonderful Hanukkah, and we hope to see you soon. Thank you.